So I, I, I just want again to, to just thank God for uh, all of you that continue to uh, be with us and partner with us. You know, the way uh, from the inception of our ministry, uh, I always had this vision that we would uh, be a, a church that is deeply uh, Pentecostal in our orientation, meaning we're just open to the spirit of God and, and, and we want God's spirit to be poured out on all flesh. Everybody say all flesh, right? That the Holy Spirit is not discriminatory, amen? That if you got a cup and it's open, then God's gonna fill your cup. Mm -hmm. And 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 we we always had this aspiration that our congregation would 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 have uh, 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 the ability to reach a whole diverse group of folks from uh, racial, economic, class, uh, geographic backgrounds, and I thank God that we've been able to accomplish that as well. And we wanted to have a thriving ministry on the campus and in the street. We wanted to be in the hood and in the boardrooms. We wanted, we wanted you to be sitting next to somebody that if you walked down the street and saw them, you probably wouldn't even stop and talk to them. But because you in church with them, amen, we build in community across lines of difference. And so uh, it has been a great blessing to be in partnership and relationship with all of you, the people of the way. And I pray that our church has been life-giving to you. I pray that it has been a blessing to your family. Uh, we both uh, talk about this very frequently, about um, uh, the, the, the ways in which people come in and out of our church kind of uh, community. And, and other than a couple of folks I can think of, most folk who have left our church for various different reasons, are still friends and we are still in deep relationship and when we see each other there ain't no cutting eyes there ain't no clenching teeth amen uh when we have ministers who are here and and they move away they always come back and we just glad to have them back and uh and on this sunday we got one of our pastors back in town and she comes probably you know, we, 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 we have her and, and, and Dedrick, where's Dedrick at, at, at with all the babies? He somewhere in the back. They, 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 they are just an extension of our family and we're so glad to be able to have all of them here uh, with us. Uh, and, and so uh, Dr. Donna Battle is gonna, is gonna be, be offering us the word of God. But, but it's, it's also worth acknowledging, amen, that we have uh, an amazing, another amazing partner with us here, Dr. Ronne Wingate Sims, who has been, she's, she's preached here before. She serves as the executive minister uh, at Imani Community Church in Oakland and uh, is preaching and leading over there. Uh, and when we were attempting to put together an ordination council uh, for our church um, to, to affirm and, and, and send and commission uh, uh, Jocelyn, we uh, thought that it'd be great to pull in some folks that are just partners. And, and so I just taken a while to just say that the church is only as good as the community we build. And, and, and I don't want any of us to, to forget that we are indeed attempting to build Christian community. And in a community, we may not all agree about everything, but we learn to live together with peace and harmony and humility and love. And, and we let time determine how our differences work themselves out. Is that all right? And so I'm so excited because most people don't want to live in a community like that. A lot of people want to live in a community where, you know, we just all lie to each other and say we believe the same thing. Touch your neighbor, amen. But how many of you know that if, if, if you peel far enough and you allow your differences to separate us, then we'll be just walking through the world by ourselves. And how many know that's not the will of God? And so the way church and all of our partners, we, we carry this and I'm just so blessed to be able to be carrying uh, this load together with all of you. And so um, as we prepare to hear the word of the Lord, I'm so excited to uh, bring back to the pulpit uh, one of our uh, most 
uh, important and influential voices and leaders in the way uh, church community. Although she lives in Raleigh, North Carolina, we are uh, kind of helping to solidify uh, a national network of the way where we're going to uh, hopefully start doing more ordaining and planning of churches, uh, particularly with folks who are coming out of seminary and wanting uh, to, to keep this kind of work of the way going. And so, uh, you know, I haven't, or we haven't figured out her. Oh, there's Dedrick. Clap your hands for Dedrick, everybody. Amen. <laughs> Dedrick battle, everybody. Just in case you're like, who's Dedrick? Well, you know, Dedrick and Donna have, were, have been uh, huge parts of our church. And so he, he's, uh, he, he helped us launch and steward our violence prevention work here in Oakland at the beginning some five years later we now have a 50 percent reduction in gun related shootings and homicides and when Dedrick came you know uh we we just threw Dedrick right in the fire of East Oakland amen and in Stockton Dedrick was one of these people going to knock on folks doors who we know were shooting people wasn't no mystery amen Dedrick be knocking on their door, talking about, hey, bruh, break yourself. No, that's what he was saying. <laughs> he, he said that in the Holy Ghost, amen. He would talk to them about how we love them and would they be willing to come to a couple of conversations to figure out how we can interrupt the cycle of violence. And, and, and he was one of the most effective people in the city doing this work. And uh, because of him and others, we were able to help usher in a um, uh, 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 significant drop in, in reduction. So as you can imagine, both of them have been integral parts of how our church has been faithful in this region. And so I just I want to appreciate Dedrick uh, um, real formally because, uh, you know, his work and ministry here has been amazing. Pastor Reverend Dr. Donna Battle needs no introduction in the civilized world. Amen. She is... Um, that she was described by someone as an angel that came from heaven. Amen. And, and I just, I was saying to myself, ain't the Lord all right? <laughs> Put your hands together and welcome the spokeswoman for the King of Glory, Pastor Dr. I give God thanks and praise for the joy of the people. Amen. Amen. I thank God most in my life for the person of Dedrick Battle, and I will always be consistent in doing that because who Dedrick is in my life is nothing short of the grace of God. And so thank you for the way he loves me and for how deeply I love him. Thank you for doing life with me and for our kids. But as always, to um, my brother Mike, who will always be my brother, and to my sister Sharice, and to sisters in ministry, to Pastor Erna and Pastor Tanisha, we be going back. And to a sister who is truly dear to my heart, to Sister Ronnie Wingate Sims, one of my um, clergy sisters who coveted with me um, when I was here, who helped pastor me. While I was here, I'm thankful that she is here and this is a gift and we will be spending some time talking about Sister Jaslyn in a minute. But for all of those who are ministers here, who all, for all of those who, of you who are the way, you are family. Friends are always family, even if family are not always friends. Amen. And so we give God thanks for the ways in which God brings family into our lives to support us and undergird us. But let me not belabor the point. God is good, amen. <laughs> Let's enter ourselves for prayer. God, we enter into these spaces and there's so many things running through our minds. And so God, we ask that you bring those things all in and that you hold them very carefully and that you take them from us, not in a way that we escape them, but in a way that allows us to entrust those things to you. God, all of the things that we are, in, we are experiencing, all of the thoughts, all of the emotions, both the highs and the lows, God, hold them in this space that we may be fully present, that we may receive from you, and that we may be transformed by it. 
Make our ears keen to the sound of your voice and our hearts sensitive to the presence of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our scripture should be appearing on our screen in just a moment. If not, I'm going to pull it up on my phone. Amen. Our scripture today is going to come from Exodus chapter 15. We're going to read verses 20 through 27. Um, what is here is the New King James Version of the Bible, and it reads as follows. Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree when he cast it into the waters, and the waters were made sweet. And then he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them, and he said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in God's sight, give ear to God's commandments, and keep all God's statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought to the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Amen. Amen. Let's talk for a little while about being in process. Being in process. A few years ago, I had the occasion to attend an event where a fairly well-known person was the keynote speaker, and he began to talk about um, calling us to this place of being extraordinary rather than ordinary. And the example he chose to use was one of parenthood where he began to step through the average day in his mind of a parent. You wake up, you get everyone dressed, you eat, you take them to school, you go to work, you pick them up from school, you come back, you cook dinner, you eat dinner, you help with homework, you put them to bed, you go to bed, you wake up, and so forth. And he begins to repeat this process over and over, faster and faster, until we're all really, really tired of hearing him say this. And in essence, I get what his point was. He was trying to say, you know, there has to be more to life than just this mundane routine, right? And yet, Dedrick and I are sitting there and people are clapping and applauding and we, you know, something just isn't sitting right with us. And maybe it's because we the ones <laughs> with them babies at the house. <laughs> like, this is my process, right? He was talking about the routine, the mundane routine. Now, in retrospect, what I realized is that what didn't really set right with me was that he was literally saying that there was no way to be extraordinary in the midst of ordinary things that we must do every day. And the truth of the matter is, anyone who has been a parent, either by blood or by surrogacy, right? Anyone who has helped parent or care for anyone, you know that it requires a lot of mundane, everyday, ordinary practices, but that it is an extraordinary thing to raise human beings, yeah. right? It is an extraordinary thing. I know a whole lot of people who would be considered ordinary, who are literally changing the lives of the people around them every day. So he missed something. He had missed the point. He had missed the variations in our routines. He had missed the ways in which seasons change routines and cycles. He had missed the ways in which we grow in inside of these routines and these practices. He had missed the point. And so when everyone stood to applaud, we did clap because the man had spent time and he had came and he had spoke and we wanted to respect that, but we kept our seats. Life 
is a process. And routines are a part of a process within many complex processes. One psychologist describes it as we are a process while being inside a process. Right? All of life is very cyclical in this way. Richard Rohr, who is a Franciscan priest and mystic, says that we are all on cycles and on process. He says, it doesn't matter. We all go through highs and lows and in-betweens, and it's always going to be cycling for the rest of our life. He says, the key is to make sure you're not cycling in place. That as you're cycling, you're moving forward <laughs> or you're moving up. That we have the capacity to grow and to stretch and to, and to um, actually expand in the midst of what life is, which is process, in process, upon process. And what is process? It is this continuous action. It is a series of um, changes that are definite and fixed. And so we see and hear this dual kind of um, process that exists in life, that we are holding two realities at once, this thing that seems contradictory. We are constantly changing in a very fixed way, right? I am a living, breathing body waking up every day, moving closer to death. Even as my body is created out of the same energy of the universe, energy that we are told does not die, simply transfers. We hold both of these realities at once. Another theologian says that uh, so much of our work and our life is about learning how to live in the face of death. And perhaps this is the most difficult part of discipleship. The most difficult part in particular of leadership of those of us who lead in any kind of spaces is that we are in process as we are seeking to lead others through their process. And so we're gonna spend a little time with this as we celebrate not just 14 years of this church and ministry, but as we celebrate the inauguration of our first sending out. The children of Israel had been enslaved by Egypt and they had just crossed over the Red Sea on dry land. They had just gotten to the other side they have become free. God has disrupted the evil process that they were in the midst of in order to set them free. And those who, from whom they were set free were actually still chasing them, trying to bring them back into bondage. Y'all, sometimes I feel like in these United States of America that we are still crossing the Red Sea. Can we finally get to the other side? But they get to the other side, and you all, salvation, this extraordinary, I mean, it literally deserves praise, and so that's what they do. They praise in the midst of this. Moses breaks out into song, and then Miriam, because we know that sometimes our language fails us, if I had 10,000 tongues, it just wouldn't be enough. Sometimes language isn't enough, and so Miriam, and then the women follow Miriam into timbrel, into shaking their tambourines, into dancing. We have to embody worship when our language fails us. And so they praise in this celebration and in this outpouring. And then they set off. They go one day, no water. Two days, no water. Three days, no water. And then finally, they come upon a place called Mara, which means bitter. But it's named bitter because even though there is an abundance of water, what they need is right there. They cannot drink it because the water is bitter or contaminated in some way. And so these newly released enslaved people, formerly enslaved people, do what most of us would do or maybe what I would certainly do, which is they turn to Moses and they complain not to him but against him. Where are we going to get some water, Moses? <laughs> you leading us. You brought us up out here. We thirsty. It's been three days. Our baby's falling out. Where the water? We can't drink this water, Moses. <laughs> Moses is being held responsible, but Moses has no power to change this situation. 
And so Moses does the only thing Moses can do. He cries out, Lord, woo, give us some water, please. <laughs> he cries out to the Lord, Lord, you got to bring us some water. Like, how you got me out here? You didn't tell me to bring these people in. Where the water, God? They kind of write where the water. And it says that in the midst of his cries, he looks over and he sees a tree. And he knows that God has shown him that tree. He picks up that tree and he throws that tree in the water and the waters that were bitter become sweet. And they're able to drink it. Now, some scholars say that they believe that this, that the tree actually had natural, that there are some trees that have natural properties that are able to actually change the, the composition of certain substances like water. Either way, y'all, he saw a tree and God provided. <laughs> right? This leader who himself was in pain and dehydrated had to be present with others who were also in pain and dehydrated. And then it says God, after meeting their needs, gives them an ordinance, the first statute, right? This, this kind of commandment, this, this kind of pathway. He says, look, you do what I say. You do what is right in my eyes. You follow my commandments and the fate of the Egyptians will not befall you because I am the Lord who is your healer. I want to heal you, but you have got to hear what I say. And then he gives them a small reprieve. It gives them just a little taste, enough for them to know he's not lying. He takes them to the land of Elam, and there, y'all, there are 12 bodies of water, 12 wells, 75 palm trees. And it says that they do what? They don't coast through. They don't say, oh, this is nice. They camp, right? <laughs> They can't. And so I want us to spend a little time working through the ways in which leadership in, in, in particular, but I want us to also be mindful that even though we are talking about leadership and, and in this particular context, pastoral leadership, I want us to always be mindful that as disciples of Christ, we are constantly discipling others as we are being discipled. And so any position you find yourself situated in, you can potentially be in the position of leader. And so in some ways, we are speaking specifically to pastoral authority, but in other ways, we are speaking to the ways in which we are all must lead in process. First thing we find out from this passage about leadership is that leadership is about discipline. Leadership is about discipline. We named this one first because this is going to show up throughout every point. Leadership is about discipline. There was a commercial that came out several years ago that I remember seeing this man goes to the gym, he runs around two or three times, he's out of breath, clearly he hadn't been to the gym in a while. He's sweating, right, and heaving really hard, but he had worked out so hard by running around two or three times, and he immediately does what? He goes and he steps on the scale. <laughs> and when he sees that the scale hasn't changed, he is deflated and hurt and disappointed, Amen. right? Y'all, the reason discipline is so hard is not simply because it is resistant to our normal process, right? It is so, so difficult to begin a new discipline because it takes a while before we can see the effects and the impact, right? We have to do it for a while, right? And just like a couple of runs around a gym is not gonna undo two or three years of unhealthy eating, <laughs> right? Hear me now, one victory is not going to undo so many years and months of losses. Okay? It's not going to do one. Celebration is a discipline. But one moment of celebration cannot overcome so many moments of lament and pain. Now, don't get me wrong. There are... There are parts of our process that is every day that we seek to make easier, right? Like, y'all, uh, Lord have mercy. If I could just clean my house once and never have to do it again. Thank you. 
I know who cleans the house now. Or even for the parents, for the, for the mothers, and even some fathers that I know who have little girls, we have quickly understood that it is just unreasonable to fix a little girl's hair every day. Right? So then about 30% of my time each month is spent either finding new hairstyles or perfecting new hairstyles that will last as long as possible while making sure my baby don't look like she abandoned in the process. Y'all know all the beads, all the beads. Beads and braids, beads and braids. And yet, though there are things that we must do continually in process, right, that we can shift and change so that we don't have to do them as often, eventually with most things we're gonna have to do them again. Y'all, the children of Israel had been enslaved for decades. Enslaved for decades. They were in a perpetual state of lament. There was no celebration up in there. They were in lament, and they were hurting, and they were in pain. You cannot have that much pain and expect one moment of victory with so many losses to just be erased in just one moment's time. There has to be a discipline, a consistency of spiritual disciplines that shift and alter, right? In order for them to heal, even healing needed to become a part of their discipline. They had to learn it, right? And so what do we see happening in this passage? They do. They come out and they celebrate. That is a spiritual discipline. Praise and worship is a spiritual discipline, right? But then they hit another low point. And so close after their first victory in a long time, they are faced once again with what they have seen most of the time, which is loss. It comes up, and they don't have the stamina. They don't have the spiritual stamina or the trust to say, okay, I'm going to trust God to do this. No, we've been enslaved, and now all of a sudden we out here, and we about to die of thirst. We now know, y'all, that we can go weeks without food, but we can only go about three or four days without water. They were literally near death. And who is it that they cry out to? They don't cry out to God, y'all. They cry out to Moses their leader, because he was the one that was there. And it is Moses who must pray. It is Moses who is also hurting and struggling with abandonment and ain't fully all there, right? <laughs> it is Moses who has to say, okay, they can't depend upon God, but I ain't got no choice. I have to, <laughs> right? He prays to God, and then God makes a way. And then I want you to notice what God does. God says, I'm giving you your first ordinance or your statute. Y'all, this is still discipline. He's giving them a commandment. He's saying, I'm giving you steps to follow, practices, action, that you must do consistently over time in order to access what I want you to have, healing. He says, do what I say. Do what is right in my eyes. He says, follow my commandments. Because what I want to do is to heal you. But furthermore, the author of this passage also says that God tests them. Now the tests of God are not like the test of people. Okay? The tests of God are designed to reveal one's heart. It is designed to reveal where one is and where were his people. His people were downtrodden. His people were without hope. His people were not people in pain, but pain had become their identity. It was a part of how they lived and moved. It was how they made their decisions. Could it be that in this moment of testing, in this moment of calling them to a different process, you got to do something different. In the process of changing their process, could it be that God was saying, I'm revealing your heart and I'm saying that your identity right now is off but I'm giving you another process that will open up your eyes to see who you truly are. Yes. You all, leadership, discipleship is about discipline. 
It is about process, but it is about growth in process. It is about being consistent in the ways in which we have been taught to live and breathe who we are as Christians, such that we are proximate in relation to God, and whenever we are close to God, there is healing. Yes. Discipline must be there. The second thing we see in this passage is that leadership is about dependence on God. Leadership is about dependence on God. Y'all, we got a one-year-old. Yes, thank you. His precious, he's with Moses, he's very precious. When our one-year-old wakes up at one, two, three, or four in the morning, crying and screaming and hollering, right? What do we do? We go to him, we pick him up, we pat him, we feed him. You know, he doesn't stop crying, we give him gas medicine. We start singing, we start praying, most of the time in tongues. We do all the things we can do to try to figure out what's wrong. Why? Because he cannot articulate to us what is wrong, but his cry to us is an indication that whatever is wrong, he doesn't have the capacity to stop it. I don't think it's a coincidence that this passage says that Moses cried out to God. He didn't speak, he didn't go in a quiet place. He was right up against the wall, y'all. Yeah. This when you down for the count and they enter the ring and they still kicking you. Yeah. He cried out to a, the God where if that God didn't show up, he was lost. Now, I want us to really fully appreciate the desperation of, of this space. I read a book um, not too long ago in which the main character was one of the main characters was being held hostage. And the people who were holding her hostage were trying to control her and get her to do something um, that she didn't want to do. And so the way that they were trying to control her beyond holding her captive, where they would only give her water that was poisoned. And as she got more and more dehydrated, her body began to fail, and she knew that she had to drink water or she would die, but she also knew that if she drank the water they gave her, that she wouldn't be the only one to die, that everybody else would too, because she would yield to them information that would hurt a lot of people. Literally, you all, she had access. She could see something she needed, but she couldn't access it and she couldn't drink it because it would do her more harm than good. Y'all, we live in this place more often than we think. In a society that dangles in front of us the very things we need that should not be withheld from us. And as soon as we reach to grab it, it gets snatched back. Right? We get demonized. I recently read an article um, about a young family, young parents who's whose child, whose infant is literally struggling with um, a serious illness. And this illness will take his life if he is not treated by age two. And they were so happy and hopeful when the FDA finally approved a medication that would potentially save his life, only for that hope to be snatched again when they found out how much it cost and that their insurance would not cover the cost, y'all. 2.1 million dollars to have access to something that could literally save the life of a child. We need to really pay attention to what the kind of situation they were in. They were there with water. They had gone three days without it. They could see it, y'all, but they couldn't drink it. In this moment, it was either I hold out and wait for deliverance or I just drink and I die. And so Moses 
cries out to God in dependency. I mean, he is totally dependent. How do we know Moses is dependent? We know that because Moses assumes in his crying out that God is going to answer. Just like my one-year-old assumes that when he cries out, one of us going to show up. Right? Otherwise, he just stopped crying out. Moses assumes that God is going to show up, and then what does that assumption do? That assumption opens him to the unorthodox way that God chooses to meet the need. Y'all, God show him a tree. Not another body of water. Moses didn't take his magical or his really, his staff that had parted the Red Sea, right? It won't the staff, it won't something they had seen before. Moses sees a tree. And he knows that God is answering his prayer. He throw that tree in the water. But had Moses not assumed that God was going to make a way, he would have missed the very unorthodox way that God was going to show up. And so in leading and in discipling others, we are completely dependent upon God. And we assume that God is going to show up. And in assuming that, we are open to God showing up however God chooses to show up. Y'all, these people were dependent upon a human master for decades. But here Moses is modeling for them. He ain't even trying to teach them, y'all. He's just modeling for them that their dependence cannot be in a human master. Their dependence must be upon the almighty God. But then third, this passage shows us that leadership is about foresight in the present. It is about foresight in the present. One of the most prophetic sermons I have ever heard in my life was preached by the Reverend Dr. Cecilia Bryant, who was out of the AME Church at Shaw University. She preached a sermon entitled, and all you got to do is hear the title. The eyes of the future are looking back on us and praying we see beyond our time. My daddy used to tell a joke about a man where every time the sun was shining high, he would grab his umbrella and walk around with it. And he did this so many times that his coworkers laughing and joking about him finally asked him why. And he says to them, he says, any fool will grab an umbrella when it's raining. He said, but it takes a wise man to grab one when there's no rain in sight, just in case it comes, right? Noah was a laughing stock. Talking about rain is coming, building this great big old ark, like huge, y'all. Everybody laughing. Ain't no rain coming. Ain't that, ain't no, ain't that much rain, you know, Noah, in the world that can lift this big old thing. <laughs> he was a laughing stock. And then we go to Matthew 16. Can you bring that, that up? Because I don't want to miss this. Matthew 16. Jesus, then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him. This testing is very different, right? When we test folk, we test in order to humiliate, right? To bring shame, or at least in this case we do, to make sure people are are good enough. Can you meet the standard? When the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, asked that he should show them a sign from heaven, he answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Y'all, hear me. The question then becomes, where does this show up in the passage? Well, Moses isn't the only leader in the passage. Now, I would make that another point, but that would make the sermon too long. So I would simply say, Moses, don't lead in isolation. Y'all remember that. Don't lead in isolation. If we go back to the beginning, Miriam does what? She takes up her tambourine, and she goes out to dance, and the women follow her. 
There's another good point for leaders. Much like Peter, she does not invite the women or ask them to come with her. They just follow her. When you lead, people gonna follow you regardless, right? Most texts refer to Miriam, not as a prophetess, but just as a prophet, right? Both are the same things. It's just one, they engender one, right? She's a prophet. So now the question becomes for us, what is it about Miriam that, that warrants her being called a prophet? One who is able to see that the trajectory that we on will lead to dismal prospects if we don't shift. One, a prophet who then leads and calls people back into right relationship with God such that our future won't be as bad as they foresee. What warrants her being called a prophet? Well, an acquaintance of mine, Rabbi Jenny Solomon, says that in the Jewish faith, they have this practice of asking questions in order to find the story behind the story. She says that one such question of their faith shows up in this passage, and that question is this. Where in the world did enslaved people in the wilderness get tambourines? They some bad man pajamas. Where they get tambourines, y'all? And so this is what she says. She says, so we must surmise that they were making tambourines while in bondage. That they were crafting the tools of freedom and celebration while they were in bondage. Come on now. And if this is true, if this is true, this means that Miriam and other women had the foresight in the present moment of where they were, of what was to come, and they were preparing for what they could not see but believed would happen. Now, y'all, I want to be clear here. This is not escapism. This isn't, oh, I'm just going to ignore the realities of my life, right? No, this is, I'm very clear about the pain that I'm in, and the only way I'm going to make it through is to stand on the hope and to move in the direction I need to move in. But a semblance of this shows up in another part of this passage. As we move forward, as God delivers God's people, as God has given this ordinance, where does God take them? God takes them to a place where they can camp by the waters. You all, another discipline, Sabbath, right? Rest, this foresight, this idea that we must be able to discern in the present what we need in the future, right? So we be very fully present where we are but discerning what it is that we need to be doing now because what's coming next, we need to pre prepare for it, right? God takes them to a place of Sabbath, and they camp there. There is this back and forth that we see happening in this passage through these disciplines. What happens? They are in slavery. They are freed. They celebrate, right? After they celebrate, which is a discipline, they move back on this process of lament because they can't find water. They come out of that process. They can't go into another defeated process. So what does God do? He brings them to a place of Sabbath. But while they are in Sabbath, what they do not know is what's going to happen next, but we do. They are about to go in the process to another low. And I promise you, if they didn't have this time of Sabbath, that thing may have broke them. In the next chapter, you go to chapter 16 and read it on your own. You will find that what? They aren't struggling for water, but they're struggling for food. They are like, where is the manna? And so what we see God doing is very much in the present, giving them what they need in order to have enough strength to get through the next step of the process so that they don't fall apart. <laughs> Foresight in the present. And as I prepare to take my seat, there is one more thing lingering 
in this passage that I think we just need to at least name. It's not another point. Don't get scared. <laughs> but what we see is that when, when they call out for salvation, when Moses cries out, God comes and God saves. And that the people are saved too, even in their anger, in their fear, in their pain. That their salvation, even in this Old Testament text, was not dependent upon their perfection, nor was it dependent upon them getting it right. That God just shows up and saves. And so we have this space in leadership. We have this space in discipleship where we are depending upon the grace of God in these never-ending processes that rotate highs and lows, hopefully moving in a way where we can see that what I went through last year that I'm going through now, I'm responding to it in a different way. We're doing this because we are what? Co-laborers. Just as God used Moses to disrupt an evil system, even as Moses was in his process, God is saying, I need you to be continuous and constant in your process of healing. Why? Because I have other systems that I need for you to disrupt. You all, we lean into process. We lean into discipline. We lean into these cycles. Why? Because we believe that some point, at some point, God is going to make all this right. And I'm going to be honest with you. If we don't believe that God is going to make this thing right, my only question is, then what's the point? In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.